My name is Josh Chernoff, and it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you from 83 Weeks Podcast, he was president of WCW, he was Raw General Manager, he was the man behind the NWO, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Eric Bishop. Mike. How is everybody? Thank you so much for coming out. I didn't think I'd get this great of a turnout. This is awesome. I'm feeling better about myself by the moment. So we are going to, most of this is just going to be a Q&A. We're going to turn it over to them. Uh, I believe a, a mutual friend of ours likes to say we're handing the keys over to the audience uh, for this. So get your questions ready. I know some of you, look at that. Hands already ready. They're ready. They know what they want to do. But, uh, but yeah, but before we get to that, I just, I just want to say, Eric, this is a pleasure to be up here with you. Um, I've had the opportunity of interviewing you a couple of times. And this is just fun to be able to do a stage show like this with you. So it is fun, and it's fun to turn the keys over to the audience, too, because the shows always end up better. It, it, people get to engage and interact, and instead of me coming up here and talking about whatever I think you should want to talk about or hear, I like it better when you guys are running the show, so I'm just here for you. Each and, every one, each and every one of you people. <laughs> All right, so who here has a question for Eric Bischoff? All right, well, I saw you first right here in the red, second row. So when Ted Turner gave you the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, what was your first thought of going head to head with WWE. Was it there or was it just to build WCW? My first thought was, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Why would he do that to me? Seriously, I, I had no I had no idea that that was something that Ted was even thinking about. I I had gone into a meeting and I've told the story a million times. I won't go into it in detail, but I had a meeting scheduled with Ted in his office. And I was there to present an idea that I had that would have involved doing business with Rupert Murdoch, which at the time, Rupert Murdoch and Ted Turner were not exactly best of friends. And I knew that I had to get Ted's blessing to do it. So I had set up this meeting. I had my business plan all laid out, all the financial reasons why I wanted to do this deal. And about three, four, five minutes into the meeting, Ted interrupted me and he said, oh, Eric. What's it going to take to compete with WWF? Do we have any kids in the audience? Not too many? Oh, there we go. All right, I'll watch my language then. So my first reaction was, oh, fooey. I don't know what to, I don't know what to say. So I just, I, I, I said, well, Ted, you know, WWE's in prime time, and WCW Saturday night, our flagship show, is Saturday at 6.05 Eastern, 3.05 Pacific. Those time slots, you can't compete, right? Ted said, uh, all right. He looked over at a guy by the name of Scott Sasso. He said, Scott, give Eric two hours every Monday night, head to head with Monday Night Raw. And then I said, oh, fooey. <laughs> <laughs> what am I gonna do now? And it just took me, you know, a couple weeks to figure out how to at least try to compete, and we did, and that's what Nitro, that's how Nitro was born. You know, it's so, it's so fascinating because I feel like, uh, you know, us wrestling fans would have imagined that this was some, this was multiple meetings, deep conversation, looking at this, we're asking, we're polling people, how can we compete, how can we compete, and for something as just monumental, completely hands down, not even a debate, changed the industry as Monday Nitro. For that to come from just how do we compete and you, you know, oh fooey, coming up with something. Um, I think that's incredible. It's amazing how those moments, these huge things can come from just, all right, I guess I'll come up and with I something. And I think, you know, in television, that's a good point, and in television and, and entertainment today, 
I don't think that kind of spontaneous decision making takes place because the entertainment business has become less and less about creative people and entrepreneurs and more and more about bankers mm. and you know lawyers and everything is created by committee you know Ted Turner was a he was a visionary and when he got an idea in his mind he just did it and people like that are few and far between in today's world unfortunately all right another question here right here that's that third row My question, what was it like working with uh, Three Minute Warning? I had so much fun. That was such a cool idea. And every week, you know, I'd show up. Because I never got advance notice of what we were doing. Nobody ever sent me scripts or anything like that. So I'd show up at TV on Monday afternoons. Usually by 11 in the morning or noon, I'd show up at TV. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, somebody would hand me a rough draft of a script. And I'd look at it and go, oh, I'm going to do something with Three Minute Warning. And then... You know, you'd see the setup, and it would change a couple times throughout the day, but it was always fun because it felt very spontaneous, and the audience, ev you know, after a very short period of time, the audience knew, they knew what we were doing, and they anticipated it, so it was a lot of fun. They were great guys, great, great, great guys. Another question? All right, we have one right back there. Stand, yeah, if, can you stand up? Thank you. Hi, Eric. Okay. Um, with the demise of WCW, which you were, of course, a big, major part of, uh, we got so many promotions, like AW, TNA can really be like called, like, their roots can be traced back to WCW, and a bunch of independent promotions with that. So, do you, so pretty much my question is, do you wish WCW was still here and striving, or are you sort of proud that so many, company, so many companies ca came from the destruction of it, the death of it? Um, you know, I, I don't know how to, to answer that question other than to say I'm, I'm proud of what we accomplished in WCW. WCW changed the wrestling industry as we know it, and some of the things that people are enjoying so much today started on Nitro and in WCW and have continued on. You know, cruiserweights, for example. Nobody saw cruiserweights on a regular basis. You know, we created the cruiserweight division, and we brought in a lot of the the Japanese wrestlers on a regular basis. You know, other people brought, you know, people in from New Japan for one-offs, as we call them. But we created a division and brought in the luchadors and really established that cruiserweight division. Um, and I think that that has probably as much to do with what we're seeing today on television as anything else. And I'm proud of that. But do I wish WCW was still around? I, you know, I don't think of it that way. I, I was blessed. Quite honestly, God, God blessed me with an opportunity, and, and I had a, a great time um, being involved in WCW. But, you know, it's just like in everything in life. You know, nothing lasts forever. Make the most of it while you can. Appreciate it as much as you can, and be prepared to move on. And that's kind of where I'm at. Right here in the third row. Can you stand up? There you go. Um, this, shirt I'm this shirt I'm wearing, the Ninja Star shirt from 83 Weeks. Uh, could you explain the, the, you know, the meaning, like how this came about? Explain the shirt, the Ninja Star thing. Yeah, Ninja Star Wars was an idea, and Sonny remembers it slightly different. Sonny Ono, one of my best friends, and we were out to dinner last night with Jushin Liger and Tajiri, and had some great sushi here, Sushi Den, downtown Indianapolis. Pretty, pretty awesome. Um, Sonny and I had been friends for a long time. We met each other in martial arts. Sonny was a highly rated uh, black belt uh, in what was called PKA, which was prior to MMA. It was the Professional Karate Association. And I was a martial artist in training. We ended up training together. Uh, we didn't come from the same school, but Sonny had a relationship with some of the people that I trained with. And Sonny would come up and train with us occasionally and uh, got to know him, got to be friends. and. We would, com we, we would compete in uh, karate tournaments around the country. And now I was fairly young at the time, so I don't want you to judge me. I was like, I don't know, 21, 22, 23. <clears throat> and we'd go to these karate tournaments, and there were groupies. And that was fun. And, and just to state the obvious, 
And one night, you know, after a karate tournament, Sonny and I were sitting in a bar together and doing what we normally did after sit, after a karate tournament, and that was, you know, pounding beers and talking about what we did all day. And anyway, we sat around and talking. I think I asked Sonny, the way I remember it is I asked Sonny, I said, what did, you know, I grew up in Detroit, right? You know, got a lower middle class part of Detroit in the 50s and the 60s. 60s, really. I was born in 55. So I said, Sonny, you know, and Sonny was about my age. He's a year older. And I said, Sonny, what did you, Sonny grew up in Tokyo. I said, Sonny, what, what did you do when you were a kid? You know, how did you, what kind of shit did you, you know, I mean, I played Cowboys and Indians, right? What, what did Japanese play? Did you guys like chase each other around like samurai or what's the deal? And we got to talking about his childhood and some of the stuff that they played with. Anyway, by the end of the night, we had this idea. Sonny really had this idea for this game called Ninja Star Wars, where you you know you buy a box and you get two felt vests with that ninja screen character. Stand up, short. Stand up, hey buddy, I'm talking to you. Hey, <laughs> fucker, asking me a question and he's sitting on his phone. He's not listening. <laughs> Turn around and show everybody your sh ninja shirt so they can see the front. They don't see care about the back. They want to see the front. There you go. So there you go. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> so you would buy this game, and you'd have two felt vests with that same logo screened on the vest. There you go. And then you'd have a little headband. Remember, you know, Karate Kid was a big deal back then, right? So we had these little headbands that had a plastic eye protector attached to it. So you could wrap that around your head like the Karate Kid and protect your eyes. And there'd be six stars three red ones and three white ones. And these stars were about that big around, and they were Velcro. And they were soft, they're spongy, but they had some weight to it, because it was like a little two-penny washer in the middle of it. So you could like throw it from here to across the room. And if it hits that felt, felt it would stick. So it was kind of like tag with ninja stars. So if we're playing and Josh is running around, I'm throwing ninja stars at him. If I'm the red star and I hit him and they stick with three red stars, I win. It's, what's that? It's like a paintball, only with ninja stars. And that was the game. We came up with that game and ended up having about 5,000 of them manufactured over in Korea and uh, had them shipped back to the United States. And then we got here, we're looking at 5,000 games and I went, all right, now how do we sell them? We knew how to get them made. Now, how do we sell them? So we tried a couple different things, and it, some of them worked okay, some of them didn't. But one day, I picked up the phone, or let me take, let me back up. I was living in Minnesota at the time. I wrestled in high school. I wrestled in college. I did freestyle and Greco-Roman wrestling for a while after high school, and I knew that Vern Gagne, who is the promoter of the AWA, those of you that may know who Vern was and what AWA was, I knew that Vern was a big amateur wrestling supporter. Like, big, right? So I thought, what the hell? I'm going to call Vern and tell him, hey, Vern, remember me, Eric Bischoff? I used to wrestle at Minnetonka Senior High School and, you know, all that. And play the amateur wrestling card, hoping to get a meeting. And I did, and it worked. And I went into Vern's office one day, and I put on my black felt vest, my Ninja Star vest, and I put another one on somebody else that worked for Vern. And I was chasing him around the office, you know, we're throwing stars at each other, having fun. And <clears throat> Vern went, wow, geez, kid, that's, geez, that's a good idea. You know? And we did an infomercial. And the infomercial worked pretty well. And about a month or two after that, I get a phone call from Vern. Not from Vern, but a guy by the name of Mike Shields who worked for Vern. And he offered me a job in sales and syndication. And that's how I broke into the wrestling business. Because of that silly ass game. <laughs> Which we lost our ass in, really. We lost our ass playing with the game, but... It ended up working out okay yeah, You made up <laughs> on the back end there, yeah. All right. Oh, right here in the front. East. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll do that one as well. Since you mentioned Vern Gagne, um, when you were working there, was that before Hulk Hogan and then left to the WWF? Yeah, Hulk and just, you know, Gene Oakland, Bobby Heenan, so many of that so top talent had left How would I got you there. have handled that? I mean, because you were still breaking in. Maybe your ideals on how you would have saved the AWA if you had kept no those guys. There was no saving the no AWA. Saving there was no saving it. <laughs> no, and that, that, I mean that's not a that's not a knock. I mean Vern was extreme. Vern Gagne was one of the most successful regional promoters in the country. A lot of talent loved working with Vern because they made a lot of money and they didn't have to. They only worked once a month, 
So it was it was a great territory. Um, but Vern was Vern was stubborn, and he didn't see the train coming. He didn't think that wrestling would ever work on cable television. He didn't think that the sh the show biz, the high production values that Vince McMahon was putting into the show. He he was convinced until the day he shut the doors that it was all going to fail. And you can't you can't fix stubborn. You know, there's a saying you can't fix stupid. Vernon Gagne was not a stupid man. He's a very very smart man. But you can also not fix stubborn. And Vern, Bill Watts, people like that were very very stubborn. Right here, the ECW shirt in the front. So I love the Coach EM stuff with Steve Austin. And you, do you have a favorite moment from that time frame? Yeah, not a favorite moment, but that that period is one of my one of my favorite memories, because so much of what I did with Steve was improv, you know. Everybody else in WWE had to work off a script, right? And Vern, or Vince was very strict about that. Like, if you went, you know, you're out there cutting a promo, and he's sitting in the, uh, he's sitting in Gorilla, and he's got the dialogue for your promo sitting in right in front of him. And if you varied from it, it was not a good thing, right? And that applied to everybody with the exception of a few, and one of those few was Steve Austin. So Steve could improv. He could go, he, you know, he, he knew where we were going. He knew what the goals were. But Steve had the flexibility to go out and do it the way Steve wanted to do it, which means I got to do it. I'm playing off Steve. He's, you know, it's like a dance. He's leading, I'm following, but he's improving, so I get to improv. And it just made it so much more fun than going out there memorizing your lines and working off a script written by some person that, has no idea what it's like to be that character. So it was, it was a lot of fun. The whole thing was a blast. I have a question for you about that. With your experience being you know, the one who's approving a script to being one receiving the script and everything in between, but also your experience with Hollywood, there's always been this debate about whether or not pro wrestlers should be scripted in their promos. And the one side is, no, they need to be authentic. They need to be themselves. The other side of it is... Well, you know, if you go and see a movie in Hollywood, that's not all ad lib. That's scripted. That is, you know, somebody wrote that and their job is to, you know, portray that character and tell that story. Do you, obviously pro wrestling is its own unique beast. Where do you land on that? Do you think it is kind of like what you said? If you're a level of a stone cold, you've earned the right to, okay, you know you better than anybody else. Go do your stuff. Do you think that that's the way to do it? Where do you land on that? I'm somewhere in the middle because uh, I'm going to try to say this without sounding like a jerk. Most wrestling talent don't have the skill sets to be able to go out there and improv. That's an art form. You know, I came in, fortunately, at kind of the tail end of the regional territory business. But when I got involved in 1987, 88, 89, 90, before I got to WWE, obviously, you know, that was the last of the territory eras. And talent had to learn how to cut those promos. They had to learn how to become that character. They had to learn how to improv and think on their feet because nobody was scripting anything back then. But if you would have taken 100 wrestlers that were on TV back in that era, probably only about five of them were any good at it. Everybody else was stumbling through it, much like they are today. So I, 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 I think when a talent get when a wrestler gets to the point where they're really good and they know their characters, they understand where the story's going, and they can think on their feet. I think improv is so much more effective because it's real. You feel like the character's real. When you got younger talent, and so many of them today are still young, they've never developed a skill, they haven't had the opportunity. It's not that they're not capable of it, they've just never had the opportunity to learn how to be a good improvisational performer. Um, so they go out there and they're pretty horrible. And if you put them out there and say, okay, just go out there and cut a promo, you know, get your character over, they wouldn't know where to begin. You certainly don't want to put somebody in a position to fail put them out there and say, okay, go do this, and they don't have the tools. So those people, I think, should be scripted. But I think when you get to a certain level with certain talents, 
you know, and some of them today, you know, CM Punk certainly can do it. We saw, you know, I think the, the scene that we saw last Monday Nitro with uh, CM Punk and, and Drew and Seth Rollins, I'm pretty sure that was loosely scripted and mostly improv And it was a little clunky, right? There were parts of it that I went, oh, that's a little off. But that's, that's how real improv is, and it makes it feel more authentic. Authentic isn't perfect. Nothing's perfect. I've probably stumbled across words up here already since I've been sitting here. Nothing is perfect in real life. So in an improv situation, if it gets a little clunky and it seems a little awkward, that doesn't bother me as long as you get to the destination the way you want to get to the destination. And that segment with Punk and Drew and Seth is a perfect example of that. It was interesting, it was a little clunky, it was just different than what we're usually seeing because it wasn't so tightly scripted, but the end paid off big time and it made it magic. So I, I love to see that, but at the end of the day, there's very few talents that have the ability to actually do it. That's a fair point. All right, what, uh, here we go, right up here in the front. How do you feel about ECW, not ECW, WCW getting bought out by WWE? You know, uh, I think it was, it needed to happen. You know, AOL Time Warner didn't want professional wrestling to be a part of their company. They just didn't want it. They wanted movies, they wanted sitcoms, they didn't want professional wrestling. So I think WCW being bought out by WWE was probably the best thing for WCW. And honestly, I, I've signed autographs here for a couple hours already this morning, and I'm signing autographs for 12, 14, 15 year old kids that weren't even a thought in their parents' mind um, back when I, when I was on television, but they're watching it on the network, right? They're watching it on Peacock. So that product still exists and it's still accessible which is really great for people like me because people like you are still seeing some of that old stuff that if it wasn't for WWE, you wouldn't, people wouldn't even know that we existed. So for that reason, I'm grateful that, that WCW was sold. All right, right there, second row. What are your thoughts on... Uh Post Vince McMahon era WWE, and who are some of your favorite performers to watch now? Uh, well, I'm I'm pretty excited about what I'm seeing. I, I don't know how you all feel, but I think the, the the difference in the product post Vince McMahon and and what we're seeing today, I think, is phenomenal. I mean, it it feels more yeah. It 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 feels more spontaneous. It's less predictable. You know, one of my biggest critiques at WWE has been for a long time, up until recently, was that there's a, when Vince was there, there's a sameness to everything. It, it's like a music producer that's only capable of producing one type of music. And, and every song that that producer produces sounds kind of similar to the one before it. That was Vince's downfall. And now, Granted, he built a $9 billion business with that problem, so you know you can't be too critical of it. But I think the difference that we're seeing today, and I just had a phone call from someone in WWE very high up the food chain yesterday, the day before, someone that I haven't talked to in a long time. And he said, Eric, it's so much more fun here. We're having fun, which is, and this person said, this is the first time anybody's had any fun here in a long time, because it was, it was a grind. Working at WWE was not fun. Not at all. And it's fun now. And I think that, and I told this person, I'm not going to mention his name, but I said, as a viewer, I can feel that it's more fun because it's more fun for me to watch. The idea that the people behind the scenes and the writers and the producers are really having fun doing it actually manifests on the screen. You can feel it. It's a vibe. And uh, I think it's great. Was, the sec was there a second part of that question? Oh. Um, I'll just, I'm just going to name my favorite, just flat out favorite. I'm not going to name a bunch of them, but I think Randy Orton is one of the most fluid, 
He is so good. He's so believable. He's so fluid. His timing is impeccable. He knows how to get his character over. He's. I think he's. I think he's one of the best performers in the last thirty years. To be honest, with you. he's right up there with Shawn Michaels, for sure, in my opinion. That's a great question. Um, all right, how about we go into the back there, down the middle? You stand up over there. There we are. Perfect. What was your favorite moment when you was in NWO? Mm. You was in that NWO with Desi W? I think. I think. Oh, it's so hard to pick one. That's a problem. And it's a good question, but it's a hard one to answer because there's so many of them. And it all kinds of blends together in a way. But I think the pinnacle for me, you know, and it wouldn't have been as exciting for viewers, I get it, but the night that Hogan and I showed up on The Tonight Show and kicked Jay Leno off his own set, <laughs> I, I kind of felt like we, we kind of made it. You know, I kind of feel like we arrived. You know, when he... Go on The Tonight Show, which, you know, it's not the same now as it used to be, but Tonight Show was like the show. You know what I mean? Tonight Show was the shit, right? So to be able to go on The Tonight Show and kick the host off his desk, kick him off the set, and I went around behind Jay Leno's desk and I put my feet up on the desk, and Hogan sat down in the guest chair and I started interviewing Hulk Hogan like I was Jay Leno and putting him over. It was kind of fun. I, I remember when that was over, I went, yeah, I, th I think we're... I think we made it. I think we're doing all right. I have a, a quick question for you. Um, looking at the landscape of things now, there was something that was just on, on uh, I saw on social media the other day. It was after Raw went off the air. A video has now come out. I don't know if anyone's seen this, but it's The Rock beating up Cody Rhodes, and they say, okay, guys, you're clear, and The Rock just... F that and keeps beating up Cody and rubbing his blood on it and they then follow him and it was just incredibly done and it actually a conversation my brother and I were having about it, it actually reminded me I said that's kind of like that felt like WCW in a way like NWO and it felt like that it felt like the uh, you know lawn dart Rey Mysterio went to, it, it was that, right? Yeah. That was a fun time. It had that, and not just because these were both in a parking lot, but it had that, that gritty, that real feel, that feel where you can go, okay, the show's over, but I don't but think, yeah, but I, yeah, okay, this, this part I think is real. This is going on. It had that, and that was, that was exciting. My question for you that just popped in my head is, if social media in the way that it exists today existed in let's say that 96, 97 time period, how would you have utilized that for the NWO, for WCW? How do you think you would have utilized social media? I mean, I, I don't know. I know that's, so, it, that's, it, a, that's a tough one. It, is there anything in your mind that you've ever thought about of like, hey, if I was doing this, if that was back then, I would do this? I mean, I would have taken advantage of it. How I would have taken advantage of it, I, you know, it's too hard to sit here and imagine that, but certainly would have taken advantage of it. It would have been a big advantage to have that. Because, you know, once the show goes off the air, it's out of the audience's mind. Whereas with social media, I can stay in your face all week long until the next show. So I would have utilized it. I don't know exactly how I would have utilized it. That's a little hard to answer sitting here right now. But certainly would have taken advantage of it. I think it would have made things better. All right. Um, how about right over here? Young lady right there, if you can stand up so we can see you. Excellent. Hello. So when DX invaded WCW, we saw the DX side of it. What was going on with you when all that was happening? I was in the middle of the ring. I had, I had a, and we were live. So I had an IFB, which is a little device that you put in your ear. It looks like a hearing aid. But that allows the, the director who's in the truck to communicate with me, right? So I'm in the ring. It's a live show. It wasn't like we could shut it down and go back and finish it up later. So I'm in the middle of the ring. I'm cutting a promo, and I hear somebody yelling. Now, I'm out there, and I'm, I'm in a promo. I'm, you know, I'm, now, I'm talking. I'm, you know, I'm not listening. But I could hear somebody, you know, Eric, 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 
Something's going on backstage in the middle while I'm cutting my live promo. I couldn't stop. Go, okay, everybody, hold on one second. I got to see what's going on in my ear. <laughs> so I'm cutting my promo. I'm kind of hearing what's going on, but I can't really do anything about it. So I'm standing in the middle of the ring on live television. And I didn't really hear about what had happened until after it was all over. You know, Doug Dillinger made the decision, our head of security made the decision to shut the door and not let everybody in. But all that stuff was had started and ended before I got out of the ring. But it was it was a good move on their part, by the way. In uh, my, F, my IFB right now, uh, there's a Conrad Thompson wants me to remind you that it was daylight. Uh, it's, here's, not, that's <laughs> here's the deal. And I spanked Conrad's big ass when he did that to me. Because he started MFing me and calling me out. Because it was daylight. And you had to. I said, Conrad, we had been preempted because of NBA finals. We started the show at 6.30 Eastern in the springtime during daylight savings time, bitch. <laughs> of course it was daylight. That's why they call it daylight savings time. <laughs> If you're not familiar with that, go back into the archives of 83 Weeks. It uh, may not have been your most enjoyable one in the, in the process, but listening to it was very interesting. And yes, you did, uh, yeah, it put, you did it, put him in his place. It, it, it put that podcast on, its, on the map. It really did. People, you know, because we were really going at it. Conrad doesn't back down from anybody. Any, here's a problem with Conrad, getting into a debate with Conrad. He's so freaking smart. <laughs> That if you're going to get into a debate with Conrad, you better be right or be very, very lucky. <laughs> I happened to be a little lucky that day when we got into that debate, and very lucky because it, it turned out to be pretty, pretty good entertainment. All right, right here in the front. I'm just curious, uh, being a hill and as pop as you were whenever NWO was going out, like, what was public life? What was it like? Was people, they come up here and, ra like, razz you all the time? I just wonder if you had any uh, stories you might want to share about that. No. I mean, it, it's funny. It, it's interesting, I should say, because one, for me, when I would go to the ring, there were times when, especially, like, in 97, early 98, people were pissed. Like, the NWO really got a lot of heat with some, with some of the audience. Some of the audience dug it. That was, you know, one of the challenges with the NWO because the heels were getting cheered and the baby faces were getting nothing. So that created another set of challenges. But for me, I'd go to the ring... And again, I, I grew up in Detroit. I grew up in a rough part of Detroit. I got in a fight at least three times a day, five days a week. I got in a fight on the way to school. I got in a fight when this guy by the name of Bob Cayley and his buddy Frankie Prelop would steal my lunch money every day. And then I would get, a, get in a fight on the way home. And that wasn't because that was just the way it is for everybody. And it was always guys that were two or three years older than you picking on the younger guys, right? I thought that's just the way life was, and everybody went that. But the, the result of growing up in an environment like that, especially as I got older, I know when someone really wants to fight or whether they're just puffing their chest and pretending to want to fight, there's a distinct difference and you get, you get pretty comfortable feeling it. And there were times when I would come out to the ring and I'd look around ringside and there were people there that if they would have had the opportunity, would have taken it. You know, They were that hot. And sometimes they did. You know, we've had guys, I had guys, you know, come out and try to attack me when I was making my entrance and throw beer bottles at us and shit like that. that all that stuff happened. But usually once you get outside of the ring, everybody's, oh, man, I loved the show last night. Oh, dude, what's it like working with Hogan? It's like this, right? But while you're doing it, they're hot. So for me, going out in public was no big deal. I didn't get recognized as much as like Hogan or Hall or Nash because I'm a little guy. I mean, I'm five ten back then, 190 pounds. It's not like I'm six foot five and 300 pounds. You know, you can't hide when you're that big. But I, I didn't get approached too much, and when I did, people were very, very pleasant and nice. All right, right there. Can you stand up, sir? First of all, thank you for creating the greatest faction. Ever the NWO. Uh,
Just question, we've heard the backup plan if it wasn't Hogan that was going to be Sting, but how far in advance were you thinking about NWO before Hall comes in, and did you have someone else in mind if it wouldn't have been Hall and Nash that came No, that's too? a great question. That's a great question. The idea, it's not like I had the idea for the NWO. I don't want to make people believe that. But I had been going over to Japan for a couple of years and doing a lot of business over there and kind of looking at the way New Japan Pro Wrestling was presenting their product. Because here in the United States, WWF's house show business was in the toilet. You know, if you go back and you look at the ticket sales for WWF around 1993, 92, 93, 94, it, it was not a pretty sight. And WCW was worse. When I'd go over to Japan, even though the business was down here in the United States, across the board, it was down for WWE and it was down for WCW. Um, but I'd go over to Japan, like for their big New Year's Eve show, and there'd be 80,000 people in the Tokyo Dome at an average ticket price of about $100 a ticket. I mean, that's massive business, right? So I started paying attention to the difference between the way the product was presented in Japan and the way it was presented in the United States. And what I took away from that was, in the United States, particularly because of the WWE influence, and WWE influenced WCW dramatically. Dusty Rhodes was influenced by Vince McMahon and what he was doing. WCW was very character-driven. Well, we didn't have Doink the Clown. We had the, we had the Hunchbacks or some shit. Do you remember that? The, the Ding Dongs? Ding or Dongs. The, or the, right? Yeah. we had. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with that, and Dusty Rhodes got... Oh, the Hunchbacks, was, I don't the know if they ever actually happened. They were like an idea, right? Like I don't know. They could I never lose because their, their shoulders yeah, can't touch Yeah, you couldn't pin them the because they were Hunchbacks. <laughs> I don't know if that ever actually happened. No, I mean, Kevin Nash was Oz, right? You had a seven-foot guy dressed up like a fucking wizard. Sorry about the language. You have a guy dressed up like a, like a wizard, you know, it was very cartoonish because WCW was, was copying, if you will, taking the lead from WWE, who, which was very, very animated cartoonish wrestling at the time. And whereas in Japan, when I would go over there, it was treated like a real sport. It was treated very legitimately. For the most part, you still had some mass characters and things like that, like Jushin Liger, um, who's here. You, and you, you still had a bit of that, but it, for the most part, Japanese wrestling was treated by everybody as to be a very serious sport. It was covered by the newspaper. I'd go to the Tokyo Dome for their big show. I'd get up the next morning and look at the front page of the uh, Tokyo sports page, and it's all about Inoki and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Whereas in the United States during that time, the only way a newspaper would cover you or you'd get any media attention is if something bad happened. You know, somebody died of a drug overdose or somebody got arrested, right? Media wouldn't touch professional wrestling back then. So I wanted to think of a way where I could bring some of that reality and, and believability that I saw over in Japan. I wanted to figure out a way to bring that into the WCW product. So I had a kind of a framework of an idea that, that involved basically a renegade group of people. But I never went any further than that because I didn't have the talent. I wasn't like committed to coming up with that idea. It was just something that was bouncing around in my head intermittently for a period of about a year, maybe more. And then when Scott Hall, I get a phone call from Diamond Dallas Page, who was friends with Scott, and Page called me and said, hey, Scott Hall wants to leave WWE. Is there anything you can do with him? I said, sure, we can make that work, because I was very familiar with Scott's work. I was a fan of Scott Hall's work when he worked with Kurt Henning in the AWA. I mean, I was a big fan of Scott Hall long before he got to WCW. So I said, sure, we can figure something out. I didn't know what it was going to be. And then about a week or two later, Kevin Nash is available. That's when the light bulb went off in my head. I go, wait a minute. I want to do this reality-based storyline. I got Scott Hall who worked in WCW, left WCW because he didn't feel like he was being treated fairly or given the right opportunities. So he goes over to WWE, becomes a major star in the Razor Ramon, leaves there, wants to come back to WCW to get revenge on the people that treated him with disrespect. 
And now Kevin Nash is available, same thing. Kevin Nash, Oz, quit, goes to work for WWE, and now he wants to come back. So now I got my two guys that want to come back and make everybody who didn't give them the opportunities they deserved, they want to make them pay the price. That's the NWO. That's where it came from. Scott Hall first coming down the, the aisle going, hey, yo, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. He was there to exact revenge, get revenge, him and Kevin on the people that didn't give them the respect they felt they deserved. And it just took off from there. Did you, obviously, from a fan standpoint, the majority of the people took it as a, a WWF invasion angle, right? That obviously was not the original thought that you had. At what um, point? I mean, well, well, it, was it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the original thought, but it was something that occurred to me. I knew it was going to happen. Well, that's what I was wondering when you realized this is what the perception is going to be. Okay, I know what my story is. I know what we're going, what we're trying to accomplish. But at what point did you realize, okay, this is what the perception is going Early to be? Early on, almost immediately. But what I didn't do is anything to dissuade sure. that perception. I didn't do anything to lead people to believe it, but I didn't do anything to keep them from believing it because I knew it was happening, and I, I wanted it to happen. It was an advantage. Sure. People are going to use their imagination. They're going to jump to whatever conclusions they want to jump to, but if it makes them more interested in what I'm doing, have at it all day long. <laughs> so, no, I knew right away it was going to happen. All right. Let's see. Right, we're going to go right back there. Can you stand up? Yep, you. Let's sit in the okay. microphone and wait in the back for a little bit. Yeah, hang out. We got a bunch of yeah, people in the out, back there. Hang out in the back. A no, little no, no. Go, go, go to him now, but then just stay back there. Yeah. yeah, stay back there so we can give some of the people in the back a chance to get on the mic here, too. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for everything you've done for the business. It's awesome. Thank you, man. Legend. Um, my question is... Uh, you know, you were talking about earlier how some, how some talent is uh, better at uh, improvisa improvisation. And uh, as a fan, it seems to me that the best, the best kinds of wrestlers had more creative control, you know? Um, like Bray Wyatt and, you know, CM Punk. They were able, it seems they, were, they, were, they had a longer leash, you know, and they were able to say what they really wanted to say. And I was just wondering, in, from your perspective, if you think, let's just say you had to start a brand new organization with new talent and all that, would you, would you, do, you do you agree that giving them more, um, more uh, creative control is, is beneficial? As, well, uh, again, to, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier. If you've got 100 performers and only 5% of them have the... Because it comes down to talent. Just because you give somebody creative control doesn't mean they know what to do with it. A lot of talent need to be controlled. They need to be guided because they don't have the experience. It's not a knock on them. It doesn't mean that they're not great performers. They just haven't had the experience to develop that talent. It's like handing somebody a guitar and saying, okay, I want you to go be Eddie Van Halen. Well, I only know four chords. It doesn't matter. Just go be Eddie. You'll, get, you'll figure it out. Go do it. No, it doesn't work that way. Now, some people are just so naturally gifted that they learn so much faster than others. That's a God-given talent. No different than being an artist or a singer or a guitar player or, or a painter. Some people are born with this blessing, this talent, and it just comes out, and they don't have to work that hard at it. Other people really have to work at it. So I think when you find somebody, like I said earlier, when you find, whether it's a CM Punk or a, you know, a Roddy Piper or you know, Randy Savage or Ric Flair is another great example, you know, people that go out there with a microphone and they, you give them 20 minutes, they'll keep the audience's attention for 20 minutes. Whereas there are people that you give them a microphone in 20 minutes and there will be no one left watching your show. So there's no blanket, right? There's no one size fits all answer to that. The ideal would be to have 40 or 50 people that were all as talented as Stone Cold Steve Austin in terms of, or Mick Foley is another great one. Mick Foley, when Mick Foley was at his peak, um, there was nobody better to improv with than Mick Foley. I got a chance to work a lot with Mick Foley and TNA for, for a short time, but we worked a lot together. He was awesome. You didn't even have to, 
you didn't really need to go out there with much of a plan. You just say, okay, who's going to start first? Who's going to start? And one of us would start, the other would jump in, and off you go. You know, because we both knew where, th- we, we knew where everything was going. We knew where the story was going, but we had the ability to play off of each other and kind of paint the picture of that next step live, just in an improvisational way. But you're, again, you're talking about maybe 5 or 10% of the people that are out there on the roster that are capable of doing that. Right over there. Yes, yeah, you can stand up. Perfect. Nope. Can you go back? Yeah. Dude, you got to stay in the back. You're not allowed to come up here anymore. We don't want you. Stay right there. <laughs> All right, Eric. Uh, before Vince bought WCW, it's been documented that you were trying to buy WCW right. before the TV deal fell through. Had things worked out in your favor and you'd been able to buy WCW, what was your plan for the company going forward? Uh, well, there were a lot of plans. I think the biggest thing that we were trying to accomplish right away during the, the acquisition process was to find and establish a kind of base of operations in Las Vegas. We had started talking to, I think it was Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. They were interested in building a 4,000 seat venue on top of a parking garage. And that 4,000 seat venue would have been for smaller concerts and things like that. And we were negotiating with them to, basically that would have been the home of of Monday Nitro permanently. We would have been able to leave all of our cameras there, our staging, everything would have been able to stay right there. Um, so we didn't have to ship it every time we were going somewhere. So we were going to do that. Obviously, we were going to have to take a look at the talent roster and make some changes, changes there and, and slim things down. But the, the first few months of that process, we were really looking at all the ways that we'd be, we could become more efficient without losing the quality of the show. Who else? Our man's back there. He's right, he's right close to you. So if you're in the back, raise your hand. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe two more. Two I think more? there's All apparently right. an enormous line uh, for Eric Bischoff. All right, well, that's a So, yeah, so time for two more. Eric, you want to choose them? Uh, we're going to take the – no, because I sent him in the back, so we're going <laughs> to keep him in the back. I was going to rib him make him come running. Up here to get this <laughs> Good, no, you choose, brother. You choose. Anybody in the back? Anybody in the back? That guy's reaching for the microphone. He's out. <laughs> I'll take care of it. Uh, if you could start an organization today, what top five superstars would you, you uh, develop your company with? Oh, gosh, I hate questions like that because there's just so many right answers. There's no wrong answers. Um, there's a guy here today that I'd probably, the first guy that I'd call is Dolph Ziggler. Yeah. Nick oh, yeah. Demon. Oh, yeah. I just, I've always loved his work. I don't know Dolph. You know, we've never really, you know, had a conversation or shared a, shared a drink or anything like that. But I love his work, and I just think there was a lot of character there that got left on the table for some reason. You know, Randy Orton, absolutely, if there was a way to make that work. Um, yeah, those are the two. I'm not going to go any deeper than that. Because, well, what about this guy? What about this guy? But I, I, Dolph Ziggler, Randy Orton, I'd start with there, and I'd work my way down. Go over there, right on this side in the back. Right there, yeah, can you stand up? Perfect. What's the biggest rib or best rib that you've been a part of or someone played on you? I've never, fortunately, you know, 30 some odd years in the business, I never got involved in that nonsense because it never ends if you do. So I, I've never been involved in a rib, fortunately. I've never played one on anybody, and I've never had one played on me. So I knock on wood. I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that because I've heard some nasty ones, man. I don't, know. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> All right. You know what? We're going to do one more, but it has to be the best question. Oh, we got a youngster back there. He was very eager, had his hand up there. Stand up. There we go. Okay. He's like, oh, no, I have to hold the microphone now. What was it like running your first match at WCW? Winning my first match? What was was it like running it? Running? Oh, Oh, so actually, what was it like? I guess the first event where you were really in charge, what was that like? You know, I had really good people around me, so it wasn't like I felt a ton of pressure. 
I had great directors, great producers, great lighting people, great sound people. It was such a great team of people in place that I kind of inherited that I didn't really feel any pressure. I was excited, I was looking forward to it, but I wasn't nervous about it at all, mostly because I had such a great team of people to work with. To piggyback on that, what about the first Nitro that actually went head to head with a live Raw? That was, was there, different. That okay. was fun. <laughs> but that was just like, that was fun. I mean, that was, yeah. I, I, I wasn't nervous. I was excited. There's a difference. Nervous is w what happens for me, at least. When I'm nervous, it's because there's something happening that I'm not 100% in control of. But that night, I felt like I was in 100% of control of what we were doing. And I felt comfortable with what we were doing. So I, my excitement was, I wonder if we're going to actually be able to beat them. And that's fun. I mean, that's like, you know, playing football or baseball or basketball. Or it's like you're, you know, you, you want to win. And that's how I felt. Well, thank you very much. Guys, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all. Yes. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate I'm sorry it. that we weren't able to get to all the questions. But 83 weeks oftentimes, and now you guys are doing a lot of stuff on YouTube. That's an opportunity yeah, to plug let me, that. Let me, let, me, because... let me hit this real quick. I don't know if you guys, how many of you heard my newest show on YouTube called Wise Choices? <laughs> All right, if you haven't checked that out, you need to check that out. And this is a show that, talk about spontaneous combustion and improv. I woke up Thursday morning, get up early. I had my day all planned out because I knew I was coming here the next day. And I get up and Tony Khan posts some stupid ass tweet at four o'clock in the freaking morning, right? <laughs> and I responded to it. And I, then I thought, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to launch a brand new, because Tony Khan said, you know, sunsetting this fraud of a podcast, meaning Strictly Business, my podcast, because I had made the announcement the night before that we're going to put a pin in it for a while. And Tony Khan at 4 o'clock in the morning wondered what he was doing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> had a cold. Guys, he had yeah, a cold. Yeah, he had a cold. He was up No, I cold. have a cold. I, I have a cold. I'm having a hard time breathing. Yeah. It's not reading no, no, not, this. don't read anything into it. But <laughs> <laughs> it's four o'clock in the freaking morning. Come on. And uh, he says, you know, it's probably a wise idea to sunset this fraud of a podcast. No, he said it was a yeah, wise choice. I read that and I went, I'm gonna come up with a new show called Wise Choices. And I'm gonna talk about the fact that Tony Khan, who's spending tens of millions of dollars on talent like Sasha Banks and Will Ospreay and Okada, you're talking about three people right there, you're looking at probably close to $15 million that he spent in the last month or two on talent, right? And the ratings went down 100,000 this past week, and they put 3,400 people in an 18,000 seat in arena, and I thought, there's a discussion about wise choices. <laughs> and, that, and that's my new YouTube show. Check it out. Thank you all very much for coming.